All right, we will get started. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to SART 101 Strategies for Success. My name is Sarah Florman, and I'm the Sexual Assault Response Team Project Coordinator at the so Sexual Violence Justice Institute at the Minnesota Coalition Against Sexual Assault. Um, and with me today is Miranda Gonzalez, and I'll let her introduce herself. Hi everyone, my name is Miranda Gonzalez. I use she, her pronouns, and I am one of the Rural Project Coordinators at the Sexual Violence Justice Institute at Mincarsa. So in today's webinar, we're going to talk about the structure and purpose of sexual assault response teams. We'll talk a lot about the phases of systems change, which is how SVJI looks at the work of SARTs define the role of a SART coordinator, and then we'll be sharing throughout some insights and lessons learned um, through our work with multidisciplinary teams, both in Minnesota and across the United States. Um, I also want to just add, this is really a webinar that's intended for new SARTs, uh, SART leaders who are just coming into the role, and potentially as a refresher for teams that kind of need a reboot or um, kind of a return to basics. So please feel free to ask questions in the chat. Um, we will try to answer them throughout the presentation. Any question is a good question. SARTs are, are hard to wrap your head around when you're new to them. So please just anytime you need clarification or more information, um, we are happy to share that. So first, we're going to talk a little bit about the Sexual Violence Justice Institute and the Minnesota Coalition Against Sexual Assault. MinCASA is a statewide coalition driving transformative culture change to address sexual violence through advocacy, prevention, racial justice, and systems change. And within MinCASA, the Sexual Violence Justice Institute is a national program operating within MinCASA. SVGI creates long-term sustainable systems responses to sexual violence that meet the specific needs of each community. And both MinCASA and SVGI operate under kind of five core values. And those values are collaboration, integrity, courageous and bold action, prevent harm and social justice. Within SVGI, we provide training and technical assistance to SARTs, um, rural, urban, suburban, you name it, SARTs across the US and territories and other multidisciplinary collaborations or folks who are looking to start those collaborations. So the things that we are able to provide include training. So that can be in the form of webinars like this one, workshops um, within smaller conferences. We can do, um, kind of trainings on special topics for your particular team or for the SARTs across your state, um, kind of as needed. We provide resources, we create templates, things like fact sheets. Um, we have a blog, a rural realities blog for rural teams, and then a kind of assortment of toolkits and guidebooks that come out um, on our website and also through our listserv. We provide support to SART leaders and teams, and that can look a bunch of different ways that can look like brainstorming, um, helping with meeting facilitation or problem solving, um, various kind of how to, how to coordinate a meeting, how to lead a team, um, how to troubleshoot some of the issues that occur within teams, all of that. Um, and then we're also here to provide connections, connections to experts in the fields, connections to other technical assistance providers. Um, so we, you know, will connect you to folks who are a little more specialized in a particular area if you have a need. Um, we also try to connect peers and mentors. So we do things like monthly connection calls that'll be starting up in February. Um, so be on the lookout for that. Um, that's just an opportunity for SART coordinators to meet together informally with us um, and just kind of talk about what's going on, get to know each other, um, hear from each other what's working in your communities. So today we are going to spend a lot of time just discussing what a SART or sexual assault response team really is. And again, just talking about the basics. So a sexual assault response team 
is essentially a group of multidisciplinary representatives that focus on collaborations and systems change. Um, so essentially it's, been, it's people from all sorts of disciplines coming together who are devoted specifically to changing the response to sexual violence within a community. Um, SARTs do use a continuous improvement process, which we'll talk a little bit more about in detail later. And essentially a SART is just one strategy to improve outcomes for victim survivors. So for example, um, another strategy for improving outcomes in victim for victim survivors might be providing those direct advocacy services, but coming together as a SART is one way that a community can really look at the systems within their community and how they work together um, and how we can change those systems to better respond to sexual violence within the community. Next, we have um, a poll question for all of you. Um, so if you just want to take a moment to respond, um, what discipline do you work in? And how long have you been a part of a SART? All right, it looks like we have a pretty large contingent from advocacy here. Um, those of you who said other, if you are willing, if you could just put in the chat um, what discipline you work in, that would be fascinating. And then I will move. How long have you been part of a SART? Lots and lots of new folks. Yep, that is to be mm -hmm. expected for a SART 101 training. Um, we know there are lots of new ICJR grantees and some rural grantees also, um, and a lot of new teams kind of springing up. Um, this is a really very normal position to be in, both either a new team or a new coordinator. Um, so we are happy that you're here and happy to be available to answer any questions that you might have. So it looks like in chat, a couple of folks have mentioned um, that they are, oops, scrolling up. Um, looks like a stocky site coordinator and a new coordinator for Travis County as well as an MDT coordinator, a DV systems coordinator through the county. Um, some of the other folks are, or some folks are starting SART teams. Yeah, so lots of different people. Oh, an outreach and engagement manager. That's awesome. We are glad you are all here. All right, I'm just trying to juggle my eight windows that I have open right now. Um, so starting off right off the bat, who is part of a SART? Um, this is one of those questions that can be kind of as big as you want it to be. So SARTs are um, historically composed of kind of a few core groups of disciplines um, from both the government and from the community. Um, and we are also going to talk a little bit about then some of those kind of newer disciplines that might not be on um, traditional SARTs that we think are really valuable. So when you're talking about government partners, you're going to have folks from law enforcement, prosecutors or district attorneys, um, folks from corrections or probation, um, adult protection or child protection might be involved, um, depending on the age groups that your SART is responding to. You're also going to have community partners. So that'll be folks from sexual violence or domestic violence advocacy. Um, you'll have medical providers, um, SANE nurses, forensic examiners, um, folks from emergency rooms, kind of a variety of groups. Colleges and universities, if they are in your community, um, you'll have folks from potentially college or university law enforcement, folks doing Title IX or folks in student services. Um, advocates from colleges or universities. Another important community partner that sometimes comes up is faith communities. 
And this is something that, again, a lot of these community partners are gonna be really specific to your area. So if you live in a community where there are strong faith-based groups and there are lots of supports provided by those groups, that can be a place that folks go to disclose. So just kind of keeping in mind what are some of those, those extra places. Um, <clears throat> same with culturally specific groups. So if you've got um, different demographics in your community, making sure that you are providing supports for all of those folks and including those supports in your response. So under community partners, we have this other points of disclosure, um, which really, it can look very broad. It can be very unique to a community. There might be um, a particular church in your community that has, um, you know, a food program or has homeless outreach. You might have, um, you know, a variety of different services. You might have a YMCA. You might have kind of a variety of different places where folks might come to get their needs met, where they might disclose um, the sexual violence they've experienced, or they might come seeking help. So there are typically two types of SARTs, and we'll talk a little bit about the difference between the two. We have the acute response SART, um, and the acute response SART focuses on a single case. Um, when making changes, it's really focusing on changes for the individual responders, so the individual people doing the work. Um, it requires individual participation. So the people that are attending the acute SART are also the people that are responding to sexual violence. And then the process really depends on each responder for how those SARTs function. Um, the results, the intended results of an acute response SART are targeted small scale change. So these types of SARTs are really case specific. They're meant to um, help facilitate a successful outcome for a particular victim survivor. The other type of SARTs, um, and the one that we focus on primarily here at SVJI, is the systems change SART. And that is a focus on cases and processes. The changes that we make are to agencies and systems. Um, these SARTs require agency-wide participation. So not only does the individual responder who is a part of the SART team need to participate, but their entire agency needs to be um, kind of a willing part of that process. The goal of systems change SARTs is to embed those new processes in all of the systems and policies and procedures. And the results of that are long-term and widespread change. Next, we're gonna spend some time really talking about what systems change is and what systems change means. Um, so first we'll start by talking about what is a system. Um, essentially, you can think of a system as a set of interconnected parts that make up a whole. Um, each part of the system is its own system and a bigger part of the whole. Um, so I'm gonna take the example of law enforcement. So law enforcement itself is a system, but within specific law enforcement, you may have different jurisdictions um, and different forms of law enforcement, like campus police, you may have a sheriff's office in your community, as well as a specific municipality. Um, so, you also have different folks that may take on different roles within the system of law enforcement, like detectives, investigators, and then you have officers that are on the street, as well as like lieutenants and captains and chiefs of police. So all of those folks make up the single system of law enforcement. Law enforcement is then also part of the larger response to sexual violence within the community. So other systems that are part of that response can include advocacy, prosecution, probation, other community agencies, um, like folks from a college um, that are doing student services, health professionals, scene nurses, and all of these systems come together and work together um, to create to the response of sexual violence in that community. For example, um, law enforcement 
will refer cases of sexual violence to prosecution for charging. And that point is one form of collaboration. Another could be um, if a nurse calls advocacy during a sexual assault exam, is just kind of different examples of where the different systems intersect with each other to create this web that is the response to sexual violence. Next, um, we're gonna ask everyone to chat in. When have you collaborated with other systems in your work with victim survivors? We'll give folks a moment. Oh, these are great. Yeah. <clears throat> So we're seeing in the chat different nonprofits, uh, victim forum meetings, which sounds fascinating, law enforcement and homeless organizations, another really great community point, court advocacy, SANES and law enforcement. Yeah, there's, I think, part of the reason that we asked this question is just to really highlight that there's really no discipline that does this work completely in its own silo, even if you're not communicating with all of the folks that are in a typical start, you are probably communicating with a few of those other, other groups. Um, SARTs are really intended to help bring in all of those people and some people you might not have thought of and to help facilitate that so that you're able to talk to each other more easily and work together to make all of your jobs a little bit easier. Yeah, seeing task forces, advocates, human trafficking organizations, faith communities, shelters. Yeah, this is great. So we're gonna talk a little bit next about the socio-ecological model. And this is a model developed by the CDC that is really kind of intended to describe the, um, I don't know how best to explain this, um, describe the different areas that um, we are looking at when we're talking about the res both the experience of and the response to sexual violence. So we'll start with the individual level, and that is one individual person's knowledge, skills, and attitudes. So that might be the individual responder. The next level is the interpersonal level, and that includes families, friends, and social networks. <clears throat> the interpersonal is the area where sexual violence often occurs, right? There's um, folks within the individual's community um, network that is perpetrating sexual violence. The third level is the institutional or organizational level, and so that's organizations, agencies, um, various social institutions. Those are the specific disciplines that are involved in SARTs. And then we have the community level, which is that relationships between organizations piece. So that is about the collaboration, the communication, um, kind of how do, how do all of these institutions work together? And then finally, we have the policy level, which is when we're talking about state and local laws and regulations. So all of these different areas affect um, how the victim survivor is, um, is experiencing the response to sexual violence. And SART work is really focused primarily in that institutional community and policy area of individual agencies, community collaboration. And then, you know, there are some SARTs that do um, advocate for either, you know, community or state level laws and regulations. So that can be something that SARTs do as well. I'm also going to talk a little bit about the difference between systems advocacy and direct service advocacy. Um, direct service advocacy is really focused on, and on the individual victim or survivor. Um, it's focused on one experience at a time. 
the individual response, um, the unique needs of each victim survivor. And these folks might coordinate with those systems partners to support victim survivors. But when you're talking about advocacy on a systems level, um, you are thinking about many or all victim survivors. Um, you're thinking about patterns of experiences, institutionalized response practices, how the system adapts to respond to the needs of all victim survivors, and more formal coordination across systems agencies. So thinking about um, the work of a SART as systems advocacy in that we're not talking about individuals, we're not talking about specific cases, we're not talking about those um, kind of crisis moments where, um, where direct service thrives, where everything is on fire all the time. Systems advocacy is really thinking deeper. It's thinking about what are the underlying root causes of some of the violence in our community, what are some of the um, policies or procedures or habits that we have that are either helping or harming the response. Um, this systems advocacy is something that not just advocates do, if that makes sense. Systems advoca advocacy is something that everyone who participates in the SART is doing. Um, it occurs when disciplines, agencies, and systems connect with each other, share perspectives, learn about the restrictions and freedoms of each other's roles, and find ways to work better together. So focusing on those patterns, again, really thinking about the gaps and the barriers, improving that coordination, and then designing the responses to center the victim experience. So we'll take a really quick Zoom quiz. Um, I'm gonna read you a scenario, and then I'll ask you to answer the question in the poll. Um, a group of people gathered together to discuss a case coming up for trial. In the room were the prosecutor, the primary advocate, and the lead detective. Is this an acute response or a systems response? Don't worry if you're not sure. All right, we've got 81% calling it an acute response and that is the correct answer. So how we know this is an acute response start is that you're seeing um, the group of people has gathered based for specifically to meet about a particular case that's coming up for trial. In the room, you've got only the prosecutor, the advocate, and the detective. So you don't have those other peripheral systems folks that might be involved. Um, it, the specific case and the fact that they're convening to talk about that specific case is what really identifies this as an acute SART. So they're, they're talking about one particular thing. Now that acute response SART might also have conversations that relate back to how do you know? How does the response in this case apply across the board? How can we take what we learned from this case and bring it to other cases? Um, that is that is always true. But in an acute response start, you're going to be hearing individual cases. There's more issues of confidentiality and data privacy because you're talking about specific individuals and situations. All right, I see there's maybe a hand up. I have no idea. Oh, the hand is down now, okay. If you do, if you would like to um, ask a question, we will try to be paying attention um, if you've got your hand raised and then we will figure out how to allow you to unmute yourself. Um, but otherwise, please do feel free to throw your questions into the chat and we will um, try to answer them as we go. All right, so we have spent a lot of time talking about kind of these bigger models when it comes to what systems are. So what is actually systems change? So systems change is when um, you work towards improving the individual systems response 
to sexual violence while also increasing collaborations between systems. Um, it's focused on enhancing the strengths of the practice, policy, procedures, and collaboration while addressing shortcomings of practice, policies, procedures, and collaboration. Um, so when we were looking at the graph uh, or at the infograph of all of the different systems, when we were talking about what that system actually is, you can see there are like gaps that happen um, between collaboration points. Um, so systems change is really trying to increase the, um, or decrease the space between those gaps and really strengthening the different spaces between various different agencies and organizations within a community. It's also ensuring support and engagement for victims, survivors throughout all processes, um, while also continuing continuously improving over time as communities changed. Um, this is, system change is not a stagnant process. It's not something that you can do just once. You continue to do it as communities and cultures change. Here at SVJI, we like to think of systems change as coming into three different phases. The first phase is assessing the status quo. Um, the second is making change, and the third is measuring change. Um, so here we have kind of an infograph showing all of the different phases and showing that it is a cyclical, uh, cyclical process. Uh, um, we're going to spend a little bit of time diving into each one. All right. Sorry about the delay in slide action. I'm just navigating my Zoom like a pro over here. Okay. So the first uh, phase of systems change that we're going to talk about is assessing the status quo. Um, you might sometimes hear us refer to that as ASQ um, or the or phase one or whatever. Um, and that is the phase where we're really taking inventory of existing service providers. We're bringing in the voices of victim survivors and we're doing potentially a community needs assessment. So how is the community already addressing the needs of sexual assault survivors? What resources, what um, supports, what agencies do you currently have in your community? Who is involved in the response? Um, for new SARTs, this is the area where, this is the time when you're starting to think, what's going on in my community? Who needs to be on this SART? Um, what are the problems that we're seeing with the response to sexual assault? How are the providers interacting with each other? How are you all interacting with the community? Bringing in the voices of victim survivors um, is always, it's important at all levels, but especially um, early on to really better understand what is going on in terms of sexual violence and what do folks need? What, in, what do folks in your community see as their biggest areas of need, um, the biggest gaps, the um, kind of the good, the bad, and the ugly of what their experience has been, um, and really bringing those folks in to help inform um, kind of as subject matter experts. This is what it's like to be the victim survivor at the center of this response. This is what we see. This is what it feels like. This is what needs to change. Um, the community assessment community needs assessment piece can also be called a readiness assessment. Um, and that is sometimes a formal and sometimes an informal process where you're asking questions and gathering information. So you're thinking about things like the community context that you're in, the demographics, all of those things inform the state of sexual violence and also the response. So thinking about geography, population, um, the social or political climate, all of these things are really um, relevant to the response to victim survivors. Thinking about the areas of meaningful impact. So what are the areas where your community is currently really, really excelling and succeeding? What are we doing that's working really well? What are the areas that need to be addressed that we are missing? Um, the key sources of information for these are going to be both victim survivors and then also the direct service responders. So folks who are in all of these disciplines who are on the ground doing the work are going to be telling you what's working, what's not, what training do we need, 
how well do we understand what's going on in our community? Um, and this whole process can help you identify, again, those strengths and gaps, some barriers that you might not have noticed before. And this will be kind of your roadmap to creating that necessary change in your community. So some strategies for assessing the status quo. Um, again, inventory existing services, what resources exist and how do they function? Are there, are there services that are needed that we don't have? Um, and how are we meeting those needs? So if, if you're finding out that, for example, victim survivors, um, you know, there's a lot of folks who need shelter perhaps, and maybe your community doesn't have a shelter program. So who are you, who are you contacting? Um, what, are, what are your kind of um, bridges to other service providers, whether it's in other communities or folks who are maybe doing um, different types of shelter who could potentially also work with sexual violence survivors. Again, that needs assessment. It's really folks on your SART, folks who do the work, folks who are experiencing the response, and really emphasizing like, what are we missing? Is it training? Is it resources? Do we just not have enough people, enough equipment, enough time, um, specific services? Um, Communication mechanisms. So are we just not talking to each other? Do we not have a way to share information that is effective? Do we not have a way to um, do warm handoffs to different service providers? Um, you also want to really observe service providers. So you really wanna look at what are people doing? Not just what they're telling you, but also what are, what are we actually seeing? And that can be um, both formal and informal, just like, what are you noticing? If you are you know, a law enforcement officer who is working with a victim at the hospital and you are, so you're watching the SANE do the SANE's job, what are you seeing? How is that going? How are you and the SANE able to communicate? Um, if you're an advocate, how are you, um, how are you experiencing these other disciplines and what does that look like? So it can help team members to get um, firsthand knowledge of what each other's roles look like. That's also really important. So this can be something that you do with your SART as a way to kind of cross train so that everyone on your SART understands everyone else's role. Um, what it's supposed to look like, and then also what it actually looks like. So identify areas where um, staff might not be doing what the written policy says. This is something that um, can fall on the leadership of an agency as well to just make sure like, we, okay, we've got a written policy that says we do this, this, and this. Is, it, is that what's actually happening on the ground? Um, is there a place where staff words or actions aren't meeting that trauma-informed standard that we're aiming for? Um, and then this last piece is to form curious questions. And that can be a lot of things. It's, it's asking those questions that you don't always feel like you have time to answer um, in that crisis response place. Questions like, who in our community isn't being served? Who are we missing and why? Um, are there folks doing work around sexual violence that we could be including in our search? Um, are there folks who are operating outside of systems? This is something that happens in a lot of communities where you'll get folks who are, who just, you know, the system doesn't work for them. It historically hasn't worked for them. So they have created new systems that operate outside and, that can be really effective, but it can also mean that there's opportunities there for the start or other multidisciplinary collaboration to really include those folks so that we're making sure that all of our systems are responding to everybody. Um, and so, you know, and sometimes you, groups might want to continue to exist outside of a formal start. That's also fine. It's going to be dependent on each community. Um, so just knowing what's going on and making sure that you're communicating with folks who are doing this work. Um, 
what does sexual violence look like in our community? Where is it happening? Um, who is it happening to? What are some of the root causes and what are some you know, ways we might be able to, to sort of look at those root causes or get to those root causes um, in addition to improving the response? The next stage is making the change. Oftentimes when Sarah and I are providing technical assistance, we often hear teams wanting to jump into this making the change um, phase. But we really encourage teams to take a step back and assess the status quo before they move into making, making change or taking action. Three of the primary ways that teams often take action is developing and revising an interagency protocol. This is essentially a formalized agreement as to how those collaboration points take place within the response to sexual violence. It can also be a really great place and a really great opportunity for teams to discuss their roles in specific services. Um, when developing this protocol so that everyone knows what each individual discipline is able to provide as far as services go. It can also include identifying training needs, knowledge, including knowledge and skills, um, and bringing in trainers or outside experts to make sure those needs are being met. For example, maybe during the assessing the status quo, a team discovers that no one really feels comfortable using interpretive services when someone discloses sexual assault in a language outside of English. So possibly a training need would be bringing in those interpretive services and showing folks on the team how to use those services so that they can then bring that information back to their own agency. So there are a wide variety of training needs um, that starts may take the time to explore um, as part of that making the change and taking action. There's also um, teams creating programs, tools, and other resources. Sometimes teams create a mission um, for their specific SART to really ground their SART in what their goals are and what their intentions are throughout the entire process. And creating that mission can be part of making the change. I've seen a couple of questions come in. I'm just looking at the chat. So a question came in for us. Um, the question is, is it best practice for a SART coordinator to not be client serving? Um, and I started to write in the answer and I realized it's just a much more complicated answer than I could type right then. Um, <laughs> this person um, has added, they are the Spanish speaking advocate, um, but is interested in potentially taking on the SART position. Um, at the moment, that position is prohibited from serving clients um, to follow best practices. Um, I think it, it honestly depends. And I think there's a number of philosophies that, um, <laughs> that come into play here. So I think it's different in different communities. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about the role of the coordinator in a little bit, but what I will, what I will say right now is that um, there is a kind of a need for a SAR coordinator to maintain a little bit of neutrality that um, I think can sometimes be difficult. Um, so that's my guess as to why that, um, that rule was put into place, uh, but we'll talk a little bit more about that coming up. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so some strategies for change uh, that I haven't mentioned yet are, so developing that interagency protocol, training to meet knowledge gaps, changes to individual practices, changes to specific agencies policies. Um, maybe while sitting on a team, uh, it's discovered that during a medical forensic exam, same nurses call for an advocate once and wait 15 minutes, and if an advocate doesn't appear, they proceed with the exam. And maybe there's a conversation that those two disciplines have within a team where it is now decided that SANES not only call um, the hotline to a direct service organization, but they also um, send an email to a specific point of contact within the team um, to get a response from advocacy so that 
that victim survivor is waiting less time at a hospital for an advocate to respond to that call. It can also include cross-training with team agencies. Again, that sharing of information as to what each agency and each discipline can provide as far as services, changing information sharing, increased collaboration, team development. So that's again, developing missions, timelines as to when certain actions and steps are going to take place, as well as development and adherence to victim-centered approaches. Raising community awareness, sometimes outreach can be that step of taking action. Sometimes our community members don't always know what services are available to them in their community. And I start can spend some time to um, explain to the community what ser services are available and how to access those services. A lot of times that raising community awareness can happen in April, which is Sexual Assault Awareness Month, is where we see a lot of teams do their awareness raising. It's also an opportunity to create innovative programming, adding critical partners. So thinking again about those outside of the criminal legal system that are still working with and are part of the response to sexual violence, including those folks onto a start team can be a strategy for change, as well as inter and intra agency trainings. Um, so once a protocol is developed, for example, you may want to train every organization that is a part of that protocol on the entire protocol is an example of a training that may occur. All right, so then the third phase is to measure the change. Um, so really, in reality, what that is, is um, us asking the question, did we do what we said we would do? And is it working? What are the outcomes and impacts of the changes that we've made um, for good and worse? Are there unintended consequences that we hadn't considered? Um, are there new problems that have sprung up? Or um, did it highlight new barriers that we need to address? Um, you know? Or was it so successful we want to do more of it and um, you know, take it to the next level? So measuring the change can be monitoring that implementation, making sure that, again, that we're doing what we said we would, that we're following those new protocols, assessing those gaps. Um, this can be data collection. So we are evaluating um, in surveys and focus groups. We're doing case reviews. Um, we're really looking at how did the changes that we made work? Listening, learning from each other, reflecting on the impacts of those changes. Um, how did those approaches work that we tried? Um, were they effective? Did we, um, you know, did we come up with a great idea that actually doesn't work so well in practice? Um, and really giving us an opportunity to make some decisions for next steps based on evidence. So based on what it is that we've seen um, over the course of this, um, this change process, developing new areas to explore. So some strategies can be things like monitoring implementation of change. Oh, I just said that. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, I'm repeating myself already. It's an interesting time. Um, yeah, so strategies to measure are really all of the different types of evaluation that you might want to talk about. So that can come in the form of surveys for victim survivors. It can also come in the form of surveys or questionnaires for the service providers. How, and that's, that's an area we don't always think of. How is, how is this working for you, service provider? Is it making your job easier? Is there a way that we could do this better? Um, has this you know, created any new problems or are there problems that continue to exist? One of the pieces that we don't focus a ton on, um, but that is actually a really great selling point of SARTs is done correctly, the work of a SART will make your jobs easier. It will make the disciplines who are part of the SART better able to handle these cases more quickly, more efficiently, more completely. Um, so we're not only helping victim survivors and improving that experience, but we're also making our own lives easier. Um, and that's a really important part of the function of a SART. Um, a lot of times, you know, 
when we think about making a, a protocol or a policy more victim centered, um, we don't always really realize the impact that that can have. If we're making our response victim centered, we are getting better outcomes. Um, law enforcement is getting more reports. Prosecution is getting more um, cases making it to, to trial, like all of these things, right? The better we do our jobs, the better the system works for us. All right, we're gonna have another Zoom quiz. So I'll read you the scenario um, and then I will pull up the poll. Um, your team has implemented a new protocol over the past year, and now they wanna do focus groups with victim survivors to learn how the protocol has impacted their experience. What phase of systems change is your team in? And again, don't, don't worry about getting it wrong. This is, this is new information. Um, and this is actually a little bit of a trick question. Sorry about that. Um, so we've got uh, some folks who've said assessing the status quo, a couple for making the change, and then the majority for measuring the change. So it is in fact a piece of measuring the change, right? You are, you are measuring the change that you've made. You are doing focus groups to gather data on what the response has been like. The other part, and this is kind of the trick, is that this is also part of assessing the status quo. Miranda had originally mentioned that systems change is a cyclical process. So while you're measuring the change, you are also assessing the status quo for the next round of changes. Um, it really does, um, it really is an iterative process. So if you look at this, you're seeing communities are experiencing these changes. Um, and then we're looking at those again, we're assessing, okay, this is the new real, this is the new normal, this is the new current situation on the ground. What do we need to do next? How can we continue to refine this and improve this process? So the work of a systems change SART is never really done. Um, because you are constantly doing this process, the cyclical iterative process, kind of working towards perfection, knowing that you're never gonna get a perfect response. Um, and the reasons that you're not gonna get a perfect response um, are varied, but um, one of the really big important pieces is that there's always something new that's happening in a community um, or in society. So, there will be changes in resources. You might have new folks spring up or resources that go away. You might have changes in laws. You might have changes in um, new and promising practices that folks are finding in different areas. Um, you know, new ideas that are starting to be adopted because they're working really well in places. You're also gonna see differences in what sexual violence looks like at the local level. There will be differences in how social media informs sexual violence, where it's occurring, if you've got different types of locations or areas where these things might be happening, if you've got um, sort of new things springing up or again, things going away, things might shift over time. So um, another really important part of the reason that this is a cyclical process is because the world around you is never going to stay the same. So you always need to be aware of that and ready to adapt and respond to all of the changes that are going on. And using this approach of continuous improvement allows teams to build on their previous work as they further strengthen their system. So you're always learning and growing and building. You're not starting fresh every time. Once, you know, you'll have your very first cycle of systems change. And then after that, you are always just building and refining and taking what you learned and putting it towards your next batch of changes. I'm going to talk a little bit about the impact of teams, just really kind of wanting to bring it home. So when we talk about 
the teams, we really want to remain focused on the victim survivor experience as being the center of our work um, and trying to kind of trying to keep that as, as our North Star, if you will, the thing that we're always coming back to. Um, how are we improving the experience for the victim survivor? But the impact of teams can also have a big effect on individual practices. So that's again, those individual responders and what they're doing when they take a call. Every single time they are out there in the community responding to someone's sexual assault, how are they handling that? It can also impact agency policies. So that can look like a particular agency or organization deciding to change a policy um, to be more victim-centered or to be more collaborative. Um, that can look like law enforcement chain, you know, a law enforcement agency in a community changing their policy to state that law enforcement officers contact advocacy every time sexual violence is reported. Um, it can look like any one of these sort of more um, kind of organization-wide improvements that are being made. It can also impact systems procedures. So that's, again, how do we share information? How do we work together collectively? How do law enforcement agencies within a community communicate with each other? How do advocacy agencies within a community interact with each other? How do um, prosecution and law enforcement talk to each other? Um, what does that look like? Who, you know, how do we, how do we refer cases? What does that, what is that process? Can we make that an easier process or a process that is more victim centered in some way? And then really that big wide um, kind of macro view is that interagency collaboration. So how can we make sure that all of our agencies are on the same page? that we're all really striving for this victim-centered experience, um, this person-centered experience. How are we understanding each other's roles and communicating with one another? How are we including new folks and making sure that we're sharing information and that we're leaving space for feedback and questions, that we're um, just developing a really solid network or web of support around that victim survivor. Next, we are going to spend some time specifically discussing team members and their various roles within a start. So the first individual that we are going to talk about is the site coordinator. Their role is to lead, facilitate, and coordinate SARTs. Essentially, they hold the big picture and they also guide the team in the direction towards the de destination. They, um, so they also identify promising practices and can create and are focused on creating a trusting environment and engaging everyone on the team. One of the ways that site coordinators focus on engaging everyone on the team is by having um, annual or um, every six months, have a meeting with each individual team member and ask them if their needs are being met by the team, if there is something that they um, need more specifically, or if they have any feedback for the site coordinator individually as far as how the team is running. In addition, the site coordinator um, provides role clarity and keeps relationships and connections. There is conflict that occurs within SART teams as doing this work because it is hard work and conflict will occur. And it's really the site coordinator's responsibility and role to make sure that that conflict doesn't damage relationships and connections that are being held within the team. Site coordinators can also be responsible for effective documentation and are a leader in creating a culture of accountability. Now, I know we had a question earlier regarding the neutrality of a site coordinator. And here at SPJ, so we recommend having another representative of that discipline on the team 
the site coordinator is holding a lot of things. The, this is a long list of things that site coordinators have to do and have to hold. And it can be a lot of work to then also be a representative on the team for that specific agency. So that's where the neutrality aspect comes in, but it is still the site coordinator's role to remain victim survivor centered and make sure that that is still the North Star. So that's where I would say um, it isn't necessarily a neutral position in like the basic definition of neutral because the site coordinator's goal is to really focus on keeping the team victim survivor centered. Another thing I do want to call out is that this is a lot of work. Yes. And so someone just put in the chat, um, we'll use this question as a jumping off point. Does the coordinator, in addition to an advocate, help dissolve that tension? Um, in short, yes, it definitely can, um, because the coordinator's role right in that moment isn't necessarily to be an advocate and can kind of so the perspective of an advocate comes from the advocate that is sitting on the table as a representative of the discipline. Um, but still a, a way that like a site coordinator could reground the team in the tension is during a time of conflict, taking a moment to say, hey, let's take a moment to revisit our mission and our vision for this team. And is this conversation really working towards that mission and vision? Um, versus an advocate taking a specific stance on maybe a conflict that is occurring within the team. So I hope that makes sense. Uh, I do, I do want to just add like, <clears throat> so although it, it should alleviate the tension and it works really well for, for communities and agencies um, that are larger and have more staff, there can also be situations where if you've got a coordinator and a different team member from the same agency that there is, um, you know, a, a greater weight being given to that particular discipline. Um, so that's something that the site coordinator needs to be really aware of. Um, when they're talking about neutrality, it's, it's a, a huge amount of that is not taking their discipline more seriously or considering it to be more important than the other folks at the table. Just really remembering that everyone at the table, every discipline involved in a SART is equally important to that victim survivor response. Thanks, Sarah. Um, team, um, so another way to look at members within the organization is to look at the agencies as being members of the team. This really has to do with the buy-in of the SART process, right? If a specific individual is coming from a team, from an agency, but then that information doesn't go anywhere outside of that table, um, that whole agency needs to be involved and a member of the SART in order to make real change. Oftentimes we see this commitment between agencies through a memorandum, a memorandum of understanding or an MOU. Um, so that's a really formal document that just each agency signs, the leadership of each agency says, saying that we will support this SART and we will support a specific individual coming towards the SART and work towards making a change through this process. Another way to look at specific individuals is to look at the individual members of the team. So an individual member, each person that is sitting at the table is their discipline expert. So if you have a specific detective sitting at the table, we would expect that that detective is an expert in law enforcement. Team members do contribute to tasks and discussions. Um, the site coordinator, again, is doing a lot. Um, and it is helpful to have other team members also contributing to tasks and discussions based off of their knowledge and specific skill set. They are also the agency liaison. The expectation is that someone sitting on the team is then communicating the information shared at a team meeting back to their original organization um, and back to their leadership. They can also be a subcommittee member. Um, some starts do have subcommittees that um, break out and are, and are focused on specific tasks. Um, this can be case file review. Sometimes 
SARTS will form a specific subcommittee for a training that they are doing, um, as well as maybe creating a specific resource or doing community outreach or some examples of subcommittees that we have seen. And individual members are part of those subcommittees. They can also take on other leadership roles within the team. Um, for example, maybe each individual member takes turns documenting the meeting minutes or one individual sets up a Zoom meeting for the entire team to meet on. Um, so there are other opportunities for leadership roles for those individual team members that are not specifically site coordinators. Um, here, um, so as I talked about briefly on the previous slide, with the team members being um, liaisons to their agencies, that is done through a feedback loop. Essentially, that's where one specific individual, let's say a, a specific advocate, comes to the team meetings and learns and shares all of the information that is talked about at that team meeting. They then take that information and bring it back to their organization to discuss. Um, and they talk about it with leadership and other members of their organization who are not on the CERT. And if that organization has questions, comments, concerns, they can then bring that new information um, that the organization would like to share back into the SART team meeting. So that creates this feedback loop of communication that is really vital to making change within a SART. Next, all right, we have another opportunity to chat in. Have you developed a plan to make sure that there is a strong feedback loop between team members and agencies? Or do you have an idea that you would like to share today? So knowing that a lot of you are new to this work, um, you may or may not have some thoughts on this or there may or may not already be systems in place. Um, but this is, this is the part that um, often gets missed somehow within the work of a SART. It seems, um, it seems when you're learning about it, like a really obvious, clear, need and um, you know an obvious place where information needs to be passed along um, but it it does sometimes get lost um, folks you know are really engaged in the SART team meeting and then they get back to their agencies and they're busy or they can't get a meeting with their leadership or they're you know there's confusion or um, sometimes it just gets missed right so this is part of what the agency's commitment needs to include is really making sure that they're allowing for that free sharing of information. Because what can happen um, and what sometimes does happen to the best intentioned SARTs is that a group of people will make a great protocol. They will come up with some wonderful ideas on how they're going to do things. And then those ideas stay in that room or they write them down on in a, in a manual, and then that manual sits on a shelf because no one in leadership ever agreed to it. Um, so in order to actually make these things real and to make them lasting changes, you need to have that feedback loop and make sure that the SART is informed about what each agency is doing and the agencies are informed about what the SART is doing. Yep, absolutely. Newer SARTs, I think meeting monthly is a great idea. Um, and it even, even well-established SARTs, some find that meeting monthly is good. It kind of depends on what they're working on at the moment. But yeah, frequent meetings, especially when you're establishing yourselves is really helpful. Any other thoughts? Oh, nice. So there's some great comments coming in. I am really excited for all of you to be starting this work. Um, giving the representative the power to make decisions is a huge piece. And this is something, you know, depending on the agency, they might or might not fully be able to do. Um, but a lot of times we'll talk about <clears throat> your SART needing to include kind of a balance of folks. Um, both frontline workers and also people in leadership who are those decision makers. If you can get um, that SART member to have some decision-making authority, that is absolutely helpful. 
Um, but you need those, you need both perspectives. You need that, what does it actually look like on the ground? Is this even something that makes sense to implement? Um, I think we've all either been leaders or had leaders that were far enough removed from the day-to-day -day work that they need to be reminded of what's realistic. Um, so is this actually something that can be implemented? And also, um, do we have the clout to make this happen? Do we actually have the authority to say, yep, we're gonna do this and we're gonna change the entire agency's policies to reflect that? All right, so the last thing I'm gonna to touch on today is a resource that we have available um, that I just wanna highlight really briefly. There is also a recorded webinar um, that we've got that talks more in detail about this particular resource. Um, and I can, it's also available on our website, um, but it's a resource called the 10 Factor Framework for Start Effectiveness. And what this really is, is um, a report that was done within SVGI um, interviewing a number of SART leaders across the US and territories to really find out what are the most important things that are needed for a successful SART team. Um, so this report identified six internal factors and four external factors. And so I'm just gonna touch on them really briefly today. Um, just things to kind of keep in mind as, as things you want to remember to focus on or spend some time on um, with a new SART. So making sure that your team has a shared vision and model. You all understand here's, here's what we're here to do. Here's what we're aiming for. And this is how we're gonna go about it. This is what our structure is. This is what our meetings are like. Really understanding that um, having that shared understanding is gonna be really helpful in moving forward. Having diverse membership, and that not only means diversity in terms of culture, race, gender, um, but it also means diversity of opinion and diversity of discipline. Um, you want to have folks at the table with different lenses and different experiences so that you're getting a more full view of what's going on on the ground. You want, again, that multi-level leadership piece. So if, you've got, if you have frontline folks and decision makers at the table, that is gonna help you be the most effective. Creating a culture of learning. So what a culture of learning looks like in a SART is ask, being safe to ask questions, being safe to give feedback, being, it, it being a place where it's okay to make a mistake or to be wrong um, and to learn from that. So a place where you're able to own responsibility for things you might've done, um, a place where you are able to move forward um, with each other with an understanding and a, res a mutual respect. Continual improvement. So again, you're looking at those phases of systems change on all the levels and you're constantly striving to make things better and better and better. And then a really strong emphasis on relationships and teamwork. So making sure that this is a really collaborative effort, that you're, that you're paying attention to how everyone engages with each other, how we're working together, because how things work within the start can a lot of times reflect how they work on the larger scale with the response to victim survivors. If we are not functioning well as a collaborative SART team, our agencies might not be collaborating all that well together either. And then we've got the four external factors. Um, so that is gonna be the individual SART members themselves. That is a really important piece um, that sometimes gets lost um, partly out of just need and turnover and change. Um, but agencies really ought to be sending someone to the SART who's passionate about the work, who's passionate about the collaboration and about the systems change, who's knowledgeable about the issue, who, who knows what's going on and knows what needs to happen um, and who cares about that collaboration. Um, there are times, a lot of times when agencies will just send a designee, um, you might have a SART, member who just shows up and says, I was told to be here, so here I am. Um, that will happen, but it's not ideal. So that's one of those things we also um, really encourage that when you're talking to the agencies that are part of your SART, really highlight the importance of what that team is there for and um, hoping, you know, as much as is possible that the representative who attends that team understands and respects that. 
having supportive member agencies. So making sure that again, that those leader, that leadership at those agencies are on board with what you're doing. Um, that they are well-informed, that they are prepared to do things differently based on what the SART has said, um, that they are ready to make changes and that they are, um, again, as a larger entity, ready to hear some feedback, um, take accountability and be in that collaborative space. Community support and input. So having folks in the community, victim survivors and other community members, not only supporting the work of the SART, but also informing the work of the SART. So making sure that, um, that what you're doing is transparent, that people in the community understand how you're responding to these cases, how you're working together, um, and that folks who have some living experience are, are able to tell you, here's, here's what's working and here's what's not, um, and, and be receptive to that. And then the fourth is access to resources and networking. So that piece is things like being able to find um, good quality trainings or good quality information, um, having conversations with folks doing SART work in other areas. Um, really, you know, for some of you, you've got statewide SART programs. So making sure that all of those different folks are able to come together and connect on how things are going in their community. Um, we do that with our SJGI connection calls, uh, which I mentioned earlier. Um, there will be an invite coming out on the listserv for those, um, but otherwise you can email me if you don't get that. But we just monthly convene people so they can talk to each other about what are we seeing, what's working. Hey, here's this new training that I, you know, sent some team members to that they thought was really great. Um, you know, here's how we're handling virtual meetings right now. Here's how we're, you know, maintaining engagement during a, a two year long pandemic. Um, all of these kinds of issues that are coming up, um, just making sure that you've got other folks to talk to who, who know what it's like and who have gone through it. Um, for coordinators in particular, this can be just really beneficial because it, it is a big load. It is a lot of work and it can sometimes feel isolating and siloed. All right, so we've got about 15 minutes left if we need it for any questions that folks might have. Um, so if you have questions, feel free to either raise your hand and we can unmute you um, or you can type them into the chat. And this is also a time when I will plug um, contacting us with any questions that you might have. Um, we are available. You can just shoot us an email and we're happy to email with you to talk on the phone to set up a zoom call. Um, really about whatever questions or issues or concerns you might have related to to starts and to this multidisciplinary work that you're embarking upon. Um, I've definitely done TA for folks who weren't quite sure what their question was. They just sort of wanted to to run some some thoughts past me. Um, it's, it's a really great opportunity for just all of that, just really kind of informal conversation. A uh, question has come into the chat about, do you have any specific advice for choosing or conducting case reviews? And I'm gonna hand that to Miranda because she yeah. is our case file review expert. Um, we do have, I, I'm trying to look for it as we talk. Um, we do have a case file review guidebook um, that walks site coordinators specifically through the process of case file review, um, everything from assessing whether or not the team is ready to how to actually do a case file review. Right now, we are in the middle of revising that guidebook, so we're hoping to get a new, a, a newer revised guidebook out later this year, um, but I will put that into chat, that whole resource as far as how to choose and how to do key spell review. And I'm also happy to meet with folks one-on-one -on -one to talk about that process um, because it can vary a lot depending on what teams are looking for as far as what they're hoping to learn from key spell review. Okay. 
Any other questions folks might have? We went through a lot today and we really, we didn't go very in depth. There's a lot more information out there. Um, so we are happy to answer any questions or just be available. Advise, a question came in, do you have advice on how to juggle between being the SART coordinator and the medical follow-up coordinator? Oh, goodness. <laughs> That's a pretty big load. Um, I think it, it, it can really be, it can be really tough. I think um, trying to maintain that, that larger scale coordinator role where you're trying to think about all of the pieces of the system and how they work together. And also remember to focus on, on your, your individual role. Um, I think in terms of balancing it, I think it's a time management question always. Um, and I think for, for folks who, um, who take on the site coordinator role, it can sometimes, you know, people have different ways of getting into the right sort of headspace. So we've had folks who before the SART meeting will, um, you know, take a break or do something to kind of refocus themselves so that they're really consciously in the mindset of this larger SART team versus their specific advocacy work. Um, you know, we talk a lot, the neutrality piece is really important for a site coordinator. It is also, however, like not realistic that you wouldn't bring some of your, your professional experience into that role. It's, um, and in smaller communities, you might also be the only member of that discipline at the table. So it matters to really have the awareness of that. So if you are in a small rural community and you are, you know, the advocacy agency is the coordinator of the SART team and you are the coordinator, but you're also the only advocate at the table to be able to just acknowledge that and to balance it and to just be really conscious of um, allowing time and understanding of other disciplines and roles. Um, but if you're the only one there, then someone has to speak for the advocate, right? So someone has to be that voice um, and making sure that, um, that you're really just ensuring that equality and that, um, that all of those disciplines in the room are equally important. And that can mean either making, you know, giving yourself a little less airtime if you find that you're um, kind of over advocating for your discipline or potentially, um, Speaking up, there are some times where teams will have different power dynamics where um, there's members of the team that are louder or more well um, established or better known or, um, you know, more senior or something. And so also kind of speaking up and holding that space um, to kind of give, give your discipline its equal um, amount of, of time and respect in that room. I also think sometimes too, it can be helpful to delegate stat, um, specific tasks that are maybe um, traditionally held by a site coordinator to other members on the team and just recognize that you may not have capacity at every single meeting to balance all of the different things a site coordinator um, has to balance, but maybe there's another person on your team um, who can take on a little bit more of a leadership role and take on a couple of those tasks so that you're able to you know, juggle a little bit more between the two roles. So we have a couple other questions. One, can you address confidentiality? Um, I, we can briefly mention it here. Um, coming throughout this year, um, through my SART grant, there will be some um, resources and um, webinars about confidentiality. Um, in addition to the revisions that Miranda was talking about to the case file review document, there's going to be um, some expansion on the confidentiality chapter. It's a really complicated area. Um, I think when part of the reason that we emphasize systems focused SARTs versus acute SARTs is that with a systems focused SART, confidentiality is less of an issue because you're not talking about specific cases. Um, and just knowing that there are gonna be folks in the room who don't have 
some folks who don't have privilege, some folks who have more privilege than others, folks who are maybe not able to talk to each other without a release of information, all of those things um, make a systems focus start a little bit easier to navigate. Um, there are different things that different communities have done in terms of um, making releases of information part of their protocols. So making sure that they are um, really, what is the word, standardizing, making uniform those, those avenues so that they aren't breaking confidentiality so that they can talk when they need to. Um, there's always you know, the question of who can be on the start because of confidentiality. And that's another reason why for systems focused starts, it's, it's great to talk about patterns and not specific cases so that you can have folks um, from community agencies or victim survivors themselves in the room. Um, yes, Victim Rights Law Center is a great resource for that. Um, and they are actually our partner in the resources that we'll be um, sharing throughout the year. So they are a wonderful resource um, and another national TA provider. Uh, a couple of questions in the q and I'm gonna, we've got seven minutes. I'll try to touch on these. Guidance for dual DV and SV programs that are already engaging folks on DV issues. It can feel like asking agencies to join another meeting um, can be tough and also it can be tough to differentiate. And this is a really common problem. So there are a lot of communities that have, um, either dual starts or, or are trying to have both. And it really, it's going to depend on your individual community in terms of um, whether having two separate meetings is feasible. Because a lot of times there's going to be overlap. It's, you know, there might not be all the same people, but it's a lot of the same people. So you don't want to duplicate your meetings. Um, the best advice I can give if you are trying to do a meeting that is both a DV and an SV focus to really make sure that you're delineating the two, um, whether that be that you devote half of your agenda time to DV and half to SV and you really clearly mark when you're switching because the topics are, are gonna be a lot different for each of those things. Um, folks are gonna be talking about different pieces of the response in different ways. So just being really conscious of that and making sure that you're allowing equal time for both issues. Um, another question, do you have any advice for understaffed programs implementing change? Our high risk DV stocking program doesn't have a coordinator, only an advocate, which can make it difficult for any program changes to be identified by the people who are able to implement them. This is a huge, huge thing that comes up. Um, and I think particularly for those of you who are responding in crisis, you know, you're often understaffed, you're often um, overworked, understaffed, underpaid, huge turnover, there's always something on fire. So it's really hard to take that extra time to sit back and say, try to make those changes that will make your day-to-day -day better because you don't have time because your day-to-day -day is so chaotic. Um, and that, that's something that I think a lot of people um, can really identify with. <laughs> I know I can in my, my years of service provision, for sure. Um, there were a number of times where we would say, well, this is clearly a problem and we need to fix it, but we don't have time to because the problem is taking up too much time. Um, I think it can really, it can, the SART can be really helpful with that, but it, it is also just a matter then of, of balancing, of, of finding um, kind of that understanding within your agency to be able to take the time to do that. Um, Miranda, do you have any thoughts on this one? This one's tough. Yeah, I think then too, it can sometimes be relying on some of those connections and collaboration points as well to see where uh, like other folks feel like can come in when it comes to system change works. I think a lot of times when we think about the response to sexual violence, our disciplines become very, very siloed within themselves. And so maybe, um, you know, one discipline doesn't necessarily have time or capacity, but another discipline does have time and capacity to take a lead role on it. Um, so that's another thing to think about too, is that really 
a lot of start work is about collaboration and sometimes collaboration is asking people outside of the discipline, hey, I want to make this change, um, but I don't have time right now. Can you help me? Yeah, it's a it's a really tough question. And honestly, it's that's one of those kind of constant puzzles that we run into with teams is how do we how do we really do this work in a meaningful way when we don't have enough people to dedicate towards it? Um, and I wish there was an easy answer that we could give you. Um, you know, and do feel free to get a hold of us. Um, we can talk about this more one on one um, and get a little bit more detail on the situation. Um, but yeah, it's it's an opportunity, you know, I would say there, there are other folks who are going through this too, who might have ideas and thoughts. Um, and that can be, you know, something that we do is, is try to um, gather some intel on what's working for people. Um, Cause that's definitely a common problem. All right, we are about out of time, but we got one more quick question. And we have technical one. assistance. Oh, are you getting it? Okay. Yeah. I'm going to just say it out loud for the recording. Do you have technical assistance or a resource that focuses on moving through tensions and disagreements between disciplines? Oh, yeah. So I don't know that we have we a specific do. resource, do we? So in our rural realities blog, we do have a blog series on conflict. Um, so I just put that in the Q&A, but a lot of times we recommend, um, this is a really great opportunity to meet individually with us too, because sometimes it depends on the type of conflict, what's going on, power dynamics within a SART can also be a really um, important piece of kind of problem solving that tension. Um, so that, that's often a question that is really helpful to meet individually with a TA provider on. Absolutely. Yeah. We find, um, you know, there is, there is no one type of conflict, so there's no one solution, but, um, you know, it's, it's one of the things that we are most frequently asked about. There are a number of different types of resources, um, that I think we could create, but, um, in the short term, just meeting with us and asking some questions is always a great idea. It's also a great opportunity in connection calls to just sort of get some assistance from folks who might've gone through similar things. Um, just as a last piece, we will be sending out a copy of the PowerPoint along with a link to the recording um, for everyone who registered. So if you are looking for that, it should pop into your inbox sometime in the next week. Um, if you have any follow-up questions, both Miranda and I are happy to chat with you. Um, if you are an ICJR grantee, contact me. Um, if you're a STOP grantee, contact me. If you're a rural grantee, contact Miranda. Um, you don't have to remember that. We will take care of it ourselves. But if you remember that off the top of your head, that will make um, your life a little bit simpler. All right. Thank you all so much for being here today. Um, Oh, one more question. Do we provide certificates? I can. So if you'd like a, if you'd like a certificate of attendance, please email me um, and I will get you one. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.